Just blown up your ZD30 Patrol? Thinking about a Cummins conversion? Well, this episode is for you. Welcome back to the Skid Factory. We've had the Cummins Power Patrol on the road for a little while now. We haven't used it a heap, but we've used it enough to, to gather some uh, sort of opinions and information about it, along with doing the job in the first place. So we thought we'd share that with uh, anyone who's interested or is thinking about doing this sort of conversion themselves. I've actually made a list here. We're going to do, be, this is going to be pretty informal. I couldn't be bothered um, being theatrical for you. Uh, so I've just made a list of topics and how they apply to this job. First of all, we've got engine choice. So people say Cummins, but there's obviously heaps of different Cummins. There's heaps of different 6BT Cummins as well. Um, the sort of the oldest one is a 12 valve VE pump, so it's got a rotary injection pump on it. Uh, the next one up is the P-pump 12 valve engine, which is the one that people froth on. Uh, then we've got 24 valve, which is what the top half of this engine is, uh, with a VP pump, which is an electronic rotary pump. Then we've got a uh, 24 valve with a P pump, which is this exact setup. So that's not a factory engine, that's a, a customised sort of hybrid. Then we've got 24 valve common rail, which is using heaps more modern uh, injection system. And then we've got the 6.7 litre, which is very late model. Which one is best in my opinion? Um, I don't think this one is the best by any means. Just because we did it doesn't mean it was my first choice. We did it with as a bit of a collaboration with um, Rich and Aaron over in um, Canada. And basically it was a, a good way for me to get in the game as far as which engine to use. We got the offer and it was very, uh, we're very grateful for it. Um, it's a great engine and it works well. But for me, I'd probably choose a 24-valve common rail just because I like modern technology and I can see the benefits in it. One of the things you've got to keep in mind when you're buying a 6BT is they put them in everything and cars is probably the least amount of things that they were fitted to. Uh, most people would use a Dodge Ram engine or there are also a lot of DAF truck engines floating around that are coming in from the UK. Both of those engines work perfectly well and they've both got pretty similar amounts of power as standard. The only thing you've got to look out for with the DAF truck stuff is that the, they're in a truck, like a cab over truck, so the turbo faces backwards. It's got an air pump instead of a power steering pump or, or vacuum pump. Um, there's a lot of little variations like that that sumps backwards that will cost you money to change it over to being useful in a patrol. Um, not that there's anything wrong with them, and they probably haven't done very hard work in their life, so it is a good option, price dependent. I guess the biggest issues is what are you going to break when you put this engine in that's really torquey and powerful, um, more so torque. Like They don't make big power by petrol standards, but they make massive amounts of torque, and that's what breaks things. So the biggest issue you're going to have is what sort of transmission to use. This has obviously got a 4L80E in it and there's a reason for that because you are pretty much limited in power output and torque output if you don't have a strong gearbox. So we are partnered with Hughes. I talked to Pete. I sort of used my options as far as it could be the Dodge transmission or this transmission. Similar amounts of effort. One more adapter obviously with the um, 4L80 to go from the engine to the gearbox. But Pete was adamant that the Dodge transmission isn't very good it is fixable and all there's no there's no um secrets in fixing them now but basically it's it's when when you don't already have the transmission it's not a very good option so um, we chose to use the 4l80 which is a pretty bomb proof once it's been built to this standard and that comes at a price you're going to look at probably fifteen thousand australian dollars to put that gearbox behind a coming so there's a lot of cost involvement here this isn't a cheap conversion. Your other options are, apart from the Dodge Auto, um, which also needs probably a $10,000 rebuild, 
uh, the patrol manual it, it is a very good gearbox and it's quite strong but it's not it was never built for anywhere near the torque output that these engines can make very easily so you're basically going to limit what you can do with the engine if you just use a patrol manual gearbox and to be fair you don't need more than 300 horsepower out of this engine it's it's just forget about the horsepower numbers the the torque is phenomenal and that's what moves the car along the road and, and it's not a race car so um i would probably think about going to it for a 12 valve ve pump the cheapest you can find and just throw that in the car with a patrol manual gearbox in it and happy days you're going to have a reliable engine that doesn't overheat and is pretty powerful really for the type of vehicle it is jackson the young fella down the road that's exactly what he did he did the job himself over a very short amount of time and it works really well so uh, it's definitely an option if you want to be sensible about sensible about the cost that's your option leave the manual trans in it put a cheap 12 valve in it and don't mess with it too much just basic fueling mods bring it up to 250 horsepower and that is a phenomenal amount of power to push one of these things along when it's mated with high torque so 250 horsepower out of a three liter three liter four cylinder in your bloody whatever hilux it's not the same as 250 horsepower out of a six liter uh, engine the torque is through the roof because they don't rev very hard torque times rpm is power plus some other numbers the other option is a patrol auto the re4 uh, as used in our um, red patrol that we had before this one now that is a very good gearbox and it can be made to handle that sort of power and torque the problem is the bell housing isn't big enough to to contain a torque converter that that is going to be strong enough to um, not blow through as in the, the converter's got to be able to handle the, the torque being fed through it as well. And you need a physical size for that to happen, and the patrol bell housing is a, is a limiter for that. So it has been done, um, varying amounts of success, depending on who you're talking to. I don't think it's a very good option, really, although it, it would be ideal if it did work, but just that bell housing space limits it. So there you go. You're back to big dollar gearboxes if you want an tra automatic transmission. Uh, fitment wise obviously you've got weight it's a big engine it's heavy it's all cast iron i think we couldn't measure it with our gear because it, it only goes up to 300 kilograms which would probably max out on the cylinder head let alone the whole engine while it is big it's not ridiculous it's not a deal breaker at all it's it is it's only a, it's 100 kilograms heavier than a td42 but the benefit that you get from it is phenomenal compared to the you get nothing for that weight in a TD42. You get everything for that extra uh, 100 kilos or so. So I, I don't think it's a deal breaker. I did try and set the engine back as far as I could to try and keep the weight further down the car to balance out the, um, the front and rear axle weights a bit better. That required a lot of panel beating by Woody and I. Um, probably need to get like shoulder reconstructions to account for it, but i'm pretty happy with where we ended up with it sitting and we have weighed it and the front and rear weight bias is actually very good it's, it's 55 45 um the the car isn't over gvm which is the latest fashion to talk about since people watch uh, videos and think they know everything probably one of the lighter patrols around really but it doesn't have any uh off-roading sort of camping gear in it which is where where a lot of weight can come from so Yes, it can be done with the weight kept in check. You'll notice that I haven't added extra batteries, used aluminium where, where possible. Fuel pumps and filters and stuff are in the back of the car. We've tried to spread the weight out to, to account for that because front axle weight is where you get into trouble. So weight is okay if you use your brain and think about it. Um, space, again, big engine takes up space. Everything's on the wrong side of the car, so You'll see we've changed the battery to the other side, changed the snorkel, changed the airbox. Everything is around the wrong way. So you do have to use a bit of creative engineering to get around that. We've flipped things over, modified brackets, turned the, the uh, condenser around, that sort of stuff just to make it neater so there's not pipes running back and forward. So that, that just requires you to stand back and think and be a bit more creative about it instead of just trying to take the straightest path to whatever's there 
already. Whatever airbox you've got for a TD42 or whatever is not going to be big enough. So that's one of the big reasons why you, why we've done what we've done anyway. Cost of engine accessories. So I've got that big bracket. Um, some people claim that you can put that engine in with all the factory Dodge gear. Um, I, I don't know how they do it. They must push the engine way over to one side because there's stuff in the way and that's all there is to it. Not, not sure what their technique is, but I'm sure someone will let me know. That bracket there is billet aluminium. It's using all new parts. So again, you're getting, you're paying for it, but you're getting a brand new alternator that's off a, a, a known vehicle in Australia, a Toyota. We've got a brand new air conditioning pump, which is off a Kenworth truck or something like that. And it all just works pretty well. I did have a problem with belt shred when we first got it going, but we, we soon found out what that was because the, the tensioner like broke in half. So it was just like a, I don't know, it just had a failure. So the spring inside it broke. So it was just flapping around in the breeze. Uh, I just bought a, a new one, whacked it on, haven't had a problem since. So that's a good thing. Again, costs money. Cooling system. You've got to put new radios and stuff in them. That, that, all that costs money. You've got to work out your fan system. I've got thermos on it. I've had no dramas at all with it. it, it you're flat out getting the thing to get hot, let alone overheat. So that's working really well. You can put fixed fans on them as well. But if you don't put that engine in the right place in the first place, when you come to put fans in there, they're not going to fit. So you've got to think about that stuff from the very beginning. That's what pen and paper's for. Write everything down and think about it. Suspension, obviously, we replaced everything in this car with all Dobinson's gear. Some people would, would have already done that with their vehicle because it's already been kitted out and they've already been thrashing the ZD30 around for years for driving it. So you've got all that gear. That's fine, but those tower supports and those hydraulic bump stops are really something that you need to consider because you need to be able to limit the, the suspension travel or finely tune it to go with the engine height and the sump and that sort of thing that you're dealing with. These have track rods going across that come up right under the sump and you either got to sculpt the sump into a specific shake or if you lift it you can then use those adjustable bump stops to basically fine tune where the bump point is going to be. So that's all good stuff. So as far as outcomes go, what I think of it, it's very, very noisy. The engine, not exhaust, not anything, just mechanical noise. It's incredible. And that sounds cool initially, but it can get old. If it's a weekend worry, it's cool. But if you want to drive that thing every day or as a work vehicle or something like that, not to mention the, the noise that you're going to hear, but we've been abused by people for it being too loud when they're, you know, I don't know, when they're going to Karen's um, shopping trip or whatever. So not a deal breaker, but keep it in mind, it is probably the noisiest engine you're ever going to hear this side of a, a Kenworth or something. Actually, I think they're, they're probably quieter these days with um, common rail, keep the injection noise down. Economy. So far, it's been pretty bad, but half of the usage was on a dyno, so we'll, we'll wait and see. If you're plowing into it, it's going to use fuel. It's a massive engine. The car's reasonably heavy. That's just how it is. Issues I've had with it that I have to change are the shifter. We were stoked with that shifter when we got it, and, it, and it's great because it's got that tiptronic function and it fits in the console really well and looks great, but it doesn't go back to one, two, three gears, and with the the um, transmission, it doesn't have engine braking unless you've pulled it down into first and second gear, so we're, we're just like free floating when we're trying to go down big hills, relying on the brakes, instead of relying on the giant engine with heaps of compression to stop us. So, unless I can figure out a way to make that gate go further down and actually use the one and two um, and three gate in the transmission, I'm gonna have to replace it with another uh, like gated shifter that doesn't have the tiptronic function, which is a little bit annoying, but um, that's something that I just didn't know about at the time. So you know about it, so keep that in mind if you're looking for a nice shifter. Gearbox mounts. I should have learnt last time. I did a Duramax. I used solid gearbox, well, Shacklebush gearbox mounts, and it just transfers noise into the car like crazy and vibrations. I did that with the Allison transmission and then shortly afterwards redid the whole thing and, and just used 
uh, patrol gearbox mounts flipped upside down with custom bracketry and stuff like that and that's exactly what I'm going to do with this because it's it's just annoying and it shouldn't be like that um, vibrations like that aren't good for anything so hopefully that'll um, reduce the noise a bit I know it did in the Duramax car I could basically drive along and hear every gear changing through the through the floor on it so it um, wasn't real pleasant the other thing I'm going to change is the turbo and not because it's a bad turbo it's actually it actually works quite well but it's I think it would work better on a non P pump because you can't light the thing up without putting out smoke and nowadays everyone hates smoke which has changed from last week so it's it's a little bit lazy and you don't really notice it in this car because the cars because that engine is so big for the car so it doesn't need a, it doesn't need the boost to get it moving it it's got that natural like engine weight and and motion that will just get the car moving no worries at all but i looked into some other uh, uh, types of turbo and there was um uh, like variable vane that they've sort of adapted off the later model cars and stuff like that but uh, i spoke to um matt at double duty and he said oh yeah what you're what you're seeing is exactly what uh, that's normal it is a reasonable turbo but only for certain applications this is this is a a better one that's been made specifically for what sort of what I think is the best turbo for it so we've got one of them we're going to change it and see what the results are like and probably stick it back on a dyno later probably getting sick of me talking so just before we wrap it up I just wanted to mention alternatives other than the Cummins swap a lot of these older four drives they do they are going to need a different engine put in them that at some point because failures are pretty common that's how we got here in the first place there's obviously the Duramax um, if you're if you've got the budget to do this and I'm talking we're talking upwards of 50,000 Australian dollars for parts in this car so if you think that it's cheap you very much mistaken yes you could do a budget job but even the most budget job I'd say probably would cost 25 to 30 grand um, so keep that in mind um, so you're getting well into Duramax conversion territory at 50, up, up, upwards of 50k. Having done one myself, which not many people would have done both, I think that the Duramax is a nicer engine and the transmission is, is also nicer. It still takes an incredible amount of work and money to do it. It doesn't fit any better than... That doesn't fit any better than it does and, and vice versa. They both require a hell of a lot of work. So it's just... It probably will come down to your preference or what sort of technology you like or or sound or whatever apart from that a lot of people are doing petrol uh, engine conversions to them like ls1s or two three barra probably a lot cheaper outcome may be a lot more fuel usage but generally speaking people don't care too much about how much fuel they're using in in a vehicle like this when it's getting thrashed so if you're on a budget end of things then petrol engine conversion is probably going to be a better idea um, and the other stuff that's sort of popping up here and there nowadays, more so in Europe, where they do have these vehicles in, in, in Europe, um, are like European diesels like OM606s and um, diesel V8s out of Mercedes, that sort of stuff are widely used. There's obviously plenty of other engines that could go in there of all different types if you're, if you're keen enough. The other obvious option is a four-cylinder Cummins, like the 4.5 ISD. Yeah, it's widely done. But it's also still very expensive, so don't don't think that because it's two cylinders missing that it doesn't cost exactly the same amount to fit into the car. Uh, it's probably less harsh on the transmission, which is again a, a good um, sort of measure. If you can keep your standard transmission, you're winning. But yeah, don't think that they they're cheap because it's only a four cylinder. It's basically exact same engine with the front cut off it. So that's all we got for today. Hopefully some of this information is helpful to you if whether you're considering a patrol or land cruiser conversion or whether you just like some general knowledge uh, i've been doing this for quite a long time so my expectations of what the outcome should be tend to creep up the whole time and i may be overdoing myself but um, i've learned a lot doing this particular conversion and others so um, i'd like to share that because that'll help you guys make the best choice as we said there's so many options for engine conversions particularly in this chassis so hit the comments section and tell me what you would fit to your blown up zd30 
powered patrol. I've been looking into some European Mercedes diesels. They look pretty cool, done a lot of research, and I might think about something like that in the future. I've got a spare patrol lying around, so you never know. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, bell, all that. We'll see you next time. Um, 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 but, um, 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 so, um, 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 so, um, um, is it, is it recording? Is it red? Where's the red come up? Um, so, um, 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 what about a Tomatsu conversion? Tomatsus have Cummins in them sometimes. What about a Komatsu engine in your... Uh, hang on, is Komatsu even an engine? No, it's not. Yeah, I think they make engines, but they're like 53 litre V16s. Smash that in your GQ, mate. Yeah, smash it on top of it. Crush it.